Right. Let's talk some about multiplexing and demultiplexing. To me, this is multi, uh, multiplexing and demultiplexing visually. So multiplexing is about taking several things and kind of pushing them onto one channel. Demultiplexing is taking them out and separating them back again. Okay? So this is kind of an, an intuitive visual explanation. Um, the next slide is going to show this in more with more technical network detail. Okay, notice in this scenario we have three hosts represented. Um, the socket, uh, the processes, let's start at the top, processes are this blue circle, oval, and sockets are the rectangle, the yellow rectangle. Process three is sending a message to process one, and process four is sending a message to process two. Notice we've got the internet protocol stack underneath here. Um, so this is representing that encapsulation. Notice that the socket is, remember we talked about this before, the door, a connection piece that sits in between the application and transport layer. Okay? And that is the means by which processes communicate. Notice that, um, in this case, the sender here is just sending one message, so, but it is multiplexing that over the transport layer. Um, the receiver, though, this receiver host 2, is receiving messages from two different hosts, uh, and it has to separate those out, even though both of those messages, both those segments came to host 2, they were intended for different processes on host 2. Mm -hmm. Remember, what is the distinguishing identifier, um, one of them that we use to distinguish what process needs to get a message, a, a transport layer segment? Port number. Right, so the port number would be the kind of key distinguishing element to say this message from P3 goes to P1 versus going to P2. Notice the receiver is doing the demultiplexing and the sender is doing the, the multiplexing. Um, what questions do you have about this diagram? We're going to have to be on the doctrine diagram on the test. Um, probably not, but I'd like you to understand. You could explain it if you were given it. Let's talk some more about demultiplexing. We already kind of started down this path. If we're thinking about what does what are the kind of the key elements that an IP datagram holds? It's going to hold a source IP address and a destination IP address. There's going to be some other fields that we'll talk about in the next chapter, and it's going to hold the segment. Okay, so we're kind of kind of stepping down a level so we can understand what we have to contain in a TCP or UDP segment. A TCP and UDP segment generally has this format where there are there's a source port and a destination port, some possibly some a few other fields, and the application layer message. So this whole segment is going to be encapsulated in an IP datagram, which will also add on to it a source IP and a destination IP. So those four pieces of information source and destination IP, source and destination port, um, are going to be essential in identifying connections, identifying sockets. Let's talk about how TCP does demultiplexing. In UDP, so let's start with UDP, UDP identifies a socket with two things, the destination IP address and the destination port. So how do we get disambiguate? How do we tell the difference between two segments, UDP segments, that arrive at a host? We're going to say, do they have the same destination IP address? And they should, since they're at the same host. And do they have the same port? And if those are different, then they're going to be routed to different processes. So when the segment is received, it's going to do that comparison. What if we receive two UDP segments that have different source IP addresses or different ports, different source ports? Remember, there's a source, IP, uh, source port and source IP. Um, will those be 
if we get two segments with different source ports, will they be sent to the same um, process? Assuming they have the same destination IP and same destination port. Yes. So it doesn't matter that the source ports are, the, are different because those aren't used to uniquely identify a socket, a UDP socket. Port numbers are arranged in this way, and this is defined in RFC 1700. There, the first 1,024 ports are well-defined and are reserved for use with certain services. So for example, port 80 is reserved for use with the web. Um, we mentioned some other ones for FTP, what, 21, 20, um, UDP, or not UDP, DNS uses 53, is that right? Um, I think SMTP used 25. Anyway, these are well-defined um, and they're reserved, right? Because you've got to reserve it, otherwise you, if two processes are listening for packets on the same port, then they're going to get confused. They're going to get each other's packets. All right. Um, there are some other port numbers that are not assigned to kind of these well-known services, and you can see a list of them online um, through this link. You can look at that on your own. Uh, this is a diagram that explains how UDP, when you say connectionless, you're thinking UDP, how UDP does demultiplexing. It's basically what we just said, that um, if we receive, let's imagine that we're process three here, we're receiving these packets from client A and client B um, with source port and destination port as shown. And you see that both of this packet and this packet have a destination port of 6428, um, and they're both addressed to IP address C. So when these two are received, they will go to the same process, the same socket, even though they have different source ports. The source port, really, you can think of as providing a return address. So if process 3 needs to talk back to process 2, which is shown here, it's going to swap them around and send, make the source port probably its what was the destination and the destination the source. You see what I'm saying? Swap them around to kind of switch it. Uh, sorry, switch it back to send back messages to the process. So the, the takeaway here is just what we said before, where the source, sorry, the destination IP and destination port are the unique identifiers for a socket. That's how demultiplexing happens in UDP. Questions on that? Okay. How does TCP do this demultiplexing? TCP connection oriented. Think about those things together when you when you hear connection oriented. Think TCP in the context of uh, the transport layer. TCP actually does include the source IP and source port in this four tuple that it uniquely identifies a socket. So. When a host receives, when a TCP socket receives a segment, it's going to check all four numbers. Um, and let's kind of look at how that would look in this diagram. Um, you see, in this case, I've got clients A and B talking to server C. About, um, when they're sending these messages, the each one of these is on is a different socket because they each have a different source destination IP um, for tuple. Does that make sense? So with TCP, all four numbers, source IP and port, destination IP and port, are used to demultiplex, to uniquely identify a connection. So you see in this case, connection pairs are unique. Um, the authors also throw this in. Usually, you wouldn't have a different process. If you say if you were running a web server, you wouldn't have a different process for every socket, but you use threads and have multi, a multi-threaded web server so that um, it, it would be more efficient and run faster. Instead of spawning a bunch of processes, you can take care of all these different requests with different threads. So it would look more like this. Yeah, you want to see this? I got that. I 
I thought it was some more stuff that I didn't get. Okay. Um, so these are basically the same, but just showing you how that might be implemented differently. So this is, um, we looked at kind of the basic transport layer services and how multiplexing and demultiplexing happen. Any questions on that?